You are watching Seven River Sports here on KQEG. I'm your host, Terry Erickson. Each week, we bring you an inside look into sports, wellness, and fitness. Well, today, you're going to be so impressed. Make sure you call the studio to get a copy of this or on YouTube. We are going to go back in time a little bit and catch up with Matt Imes. Matt Imes uh, at the club, played for me, Central, Wisconsin, the university. What a journey, all kinds of stops all throughout the country in the sport of rowing, and just not too long ago returned from the 2016 Olympics in Rio. Welcome to the show, Matt. Thank you very much, Terry. Good to be here. Maybe a lot of our viewers don't know your journey, and your journey is both impressive and enlightening, and it started when I got to know you as a club athlete. I mean, that, that, let's talk about those times. Sure. I think I first met you when I was in sixth grade. Just got done. Some of my friends were playing for the Boys and Girls Club basketball, and uh, after finally begging my parents to let me go and try out and play, they uh, let me come and uh, play for you there for a couple of years. Yeah, and we really enjoy having you. It was a good team, and, and you were uh, you were full of enthusiasm and character and so on at that time, and and you were a welcome asset to the club. And then from there. I followed you, uh, your success at Central, both as a student and as an athlete. Uh, yeah, I don't know about how much success was there, but I had a great time. I played multiple sports and uh, track and field, basketball, tried a bunch of things and, you know, had a great experience, so. Defining moment in your high school career, what would that be? Oh, probably more our failures than our successes, huh? Like, you always remember the ones that you wanted to win, so. Uh, you know, growing up in lacrosse and playing against like Aquinas and Logan and on Alaska is just, especially back then, like, you know, 30 plus years ago, <laughs> it was great. We had lots of friends on all those teams and being able to play that and like the way the community got behind and like just how big those games felt was always something that I think you'll never, never forget once you've done it. Well, I followed you as both a fan and a broadcaster and a referee. And then from there, maybe some people lost track of Matt Imes. And from there, went to the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where three of our children graduated from. And you had uh, an outstanding career, both, both as a student and as an athlete. Well, yeah, <laughs> kind of searching your way along the process. I found, uh, like I think many people in the sport of rowing end up doing, uh, found the sport of rowing at the University of Wisconsin, which had an excellent program and still does, both men's and women's to this day, and uh, ended up rowing there for the University of Wisconsin and finally getting my degree. May have taken a little bit longer than the four years, but definitely enjoyed my time there and then, uh, and then continued to be interested in rowing and be, had the opportunities to give back and, and grow on the coaching. and. You did. Well, a lot of our viewers are saying, well, Terry, you probably took a little longer than four years to graduate, too. And in fact, I did. Because <laughs> I had a couple other things in my life, too. But when I track uh, where you went from Wisconsin, Gonzaga, Oregon State, uh, before we get into the, the national team, and you, you had some really significant experiences coaching and being part of some uh, elite college teams. Talk about those experiences. Yeah, I was I was fortunate enough the when I rode at the University of Wisconsin, one of my coaches at they rowing is one of the very uh, sports that still has a freshman team. Like back in the day, lots of sports had freshman teams. Rowing still has what they call a freshman or novice team, and I had a, a really good freshman coach that uh, had gone on to Gonzaga University, and I ended up working for them and being on the West Coast as. Rowing has, like I said, continued to grow since I've been involved with it for the last 25 years, but it's been really big on the coast, on the west coast and the east coast, so lots of those programs had had uh, some kind of storied past. So it was good to be able to go out there and experience those things with the uh, University of Washington, Stanford, Cal, and, and west coast rowing, of which both Oregon State and Gonzaga provided me the opportunity to do so. When you think of the sport of rowing, too, you, you, you basically, if you look at the origins, it's not in this country. And uh, in the 1800s, it came here in 19, early 1900s, Yale, the service academies, Harvard, some of those elite schools on the East Coast developed a program, and it was f flourishing back then. And it was kind of a sport for those sort of elite athletes uh, from wealthy uh, universities. Yeah, I mean, Rowing's been around since the beginning of time. <laughs> so just in terms of whether it was warfare or commerce and how it's gone through the iterations of history, really the back in the late 1800s, early 1900s in, in the U.S., it was like a lot of sports, it was betting. 
Like when you have people moving things across a body of water, all of a sudden it became who can do it faster than the other person, and then, you know, there used to be events in Philadelphia and New York and in the harbors and stuff that would say they'd draw 80 to 100,000 people, and they'd be betting on who could do what and when, and clubs developed around that, and social clubs developed around that, and then with that, it, it moved into the collegiate and university systems, and so, yeah, there's been a, a presence of rowing that's, in some ways, it was probably even bigger back in those days than it has been now, but, yeah, it's been embedded in the... It's the history of civilization. It has, and I, I read that too. Some of the archival, uh, incredible uh, moments in history with rowing um, back before BC, actually. Uh, oh yeah. And uh, now, 91 colleges in this country, universities, uh, have rowing. I think an average of 20 scholarships per university, and. Um, and it's not quite at the level it once was because football and basketball have kind of taken over. But if you dig deep down to uh, some of the uh, elite programs and you st and you study the sport, it's still uh, a very viable and growing sport. Yeah, I think if you look at if you look at what Title IX's done, especially for women's sports, um, there's like over actually 135 women's varsity programs now. Um, Women's rowing has become a great counterbalance for a lot of athletic departments that uh, they have 24 ride scholarships as a maximum from the NCAA allowable, but a women's rowing team can have, you know, 50, 60, 75 athletes on roster, which creates a great balance for a lot of the other sports that they're doing. Like on the men's side, there's probably around 70 to 75 programs throughout the U.S. that would be from club level to, to varsity sports. and. Uh, like some of those things are directly transferable into what I see right now on like our U.S. national team, like the investment, and it's not any different than a lot of sports that have pathways for athletes to continue on once they get done in their club or indoor high school playing days. Like women's rowing here in the United States, like the number of junior women's rowers has just taken off in the last 15 years, and the success of our women's program internationally, I think, is a direct result of of what the college athletes and college coaches have been able to put together and we've been able to capitalize on on the international level of training athletes up to that. Circle the globe in your mind Yeah. of some of the programs in other countries. And wh where are the strongest programs and, 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 and why are they strong? Well, rowing is a huge sport in, in Central Europe in a European sport and Australia and New Zealand have really strong programs and it's, and it's starting to grow in China and some of the eastern countries. but. It's absolutely been something that's uh, embedded in the, the history and culture of like many Central European and Eastern European countries. So for us, like that's where a majority of the supporters and majority of the support comes from for those programs. Like they go, you go to an event there and you'll see you know, tens of thousands of people. We're here in the States, rowing's a little bit more of an obscure sport uh, in that kind of things. But there's still events. There's an event coming up this week, the Head of the Charles, which is the largest largest race in America for rowing here in, in the heart of Boston. There's going to be 100,000 people probably watching it over a three-day event, and it'll be be pretty spectacular that way. Well, not a lot of people kept up with uh, or, or interested in the sport of rowing, but I have been because I know you've been involved, and I like to just be able to watch and enjoy all kinds of sports. You know, I read something interesting recently. We're going to get into some of the components and break down the sport, but I read that uh, and this is somewhat subjective perhaps, but that <laughs> the physical fitness level of rowers, uh, those athletes, uh, when you look at the entire prototype, the strongest, the best finely tuned athletes in any sport. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about that before. And everybody likes to make that claim, and I think we actually have a really good claim of saying that you know, our athletes are extremely fit. I'm, I'm personally small for a rower, and I'm 6'2". Like our average men on the national team will be somewhere between 6'4 and 6'8. They'll probably weigh between 205 and 225. Our women's team is, you know, on average 5'10 to 6'6'1, six, six, and they're 150 to 170 pounds. And you're putting in a lot of miles, just like just like elite swimmers, elite runners, like like any any sport that you're going to do on an international level that's going to try to compete that way. Um, you're going to be putting in the time and the mileage. So. Um, one of the things that anybody involved with rowing usually gets is like, oh, you row, and they say, oh, I like that rowing. And everybody's like, ah, it's actually, it's a, the great thing about rowing is it's a full body sport. Really, it's a core in your legs. It's kind of like doing, uh, when you're in the weight room and you're doing like a clean and jerk or a standing clean, that's kind of the, the rowing stroke movement. So you come from a completely compact position to where you've driven your legs, your core explodes through, and then you finally finish off with your arms and your, 
in your upper body and you're, you're training your body to take that load and you're taking that to do for an all-out competition of like six to seven minutes so good um, you put a lot of mileage into well that's kind of an overview of the sport of wrestling when we come back we're going to break it down some insights into rowing you want to watch rowing some of the national uh, broadcasts you're going to learn a lot about that right after these messages LASIK surgery at Mayo Clinic Health System. Well, I was very nearsighted. Um, I couldn't see three feet in front of me without things being blurry, so I had to wear glasses. We screen patients. We try to make sure that they're appropriate candidates for LASIK, that their prescription is within the range, that it's reasonable to do it, uh, that they have a good understanding of what they can expect, that they have a good understanding of what the benefits are and what the risks are. For more information on LASIK surgery, contact Mayo Clinic Health System. At Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning, we have assembled the championship team. Who listens to what your needs are. We install carrier comfort systems that improve the comfort, efficiency, and the air quality of your home and workplace. We serve you with highly trained technicians who are prompt, friendly, and honest. For Gold Star Treatment, turn to the experts, Carrier and Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning. Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning, your comfort is our business. Welcome back to Seven River Sports. Again, our guest today from USA Rowing. Started in lacrosse, now is circling the globe. Matt Imes is our guest today. Well, we kind of had an overview of um, some of the experiences you've had, but let's just kind of break it down into rowing 101 a little bit. Starting with uh, the total body workout, you talked about the prototype and the fact, the strength and conditioning and so on, but I read something interesting, and that is the strength and the power is in the legs. That's right. We measure a lot of our workouts by watts and what kind of power output's being done. And so really what we look at as rowing is, is you're one big lever. And uh, so that's why we look for tall, lean people that tend to be successful. It doesn't mean if you're on the shorter side that you can't be, but uh, you're putting yourself at a mechanical disadvantage. So we're looking for long levers that are able to, um, as people learn when you sit in the boat, it's on a sliding seat. So you're able to compress and use that leg length and then the upper body length to create the longer stroke. So the longer the stroke, typically the longer pressure you have on the face of the blade, the faster you're able to generate speed. So you may you may compare that body type to like a long, sleek uh, volleyball player. Absolutely. A wide receiver. Absolutely. Uh, playing down low in the front line in basketball, that kind of. Love to see six foot six swimmers. <laughs> like or swimmers, or yeah, or exactly. runners, we'll put a little weight on them. All right, well we see, we see the boat. But there's differences in the boat, in the bow, and the stern, and so on. Real quickly, describe the boat. Well, the sport actually has like what we call two disciplines. So it's sweep rowing or sculling. So if you see people rowing and they've got an oar in each hand, they're sculling. So the boat will hold either, if it's one person, it's a single skull, two is a double, four is a quad. If you see them rowing, a lot of the, like our women's eight, who's had a tremendous success, they sweep row. That's where you have one long oar. It's about seven meters out there. One, ro one oar in your hand, and uh, those boats you have to have at least a, an equal balance on each side, so they go either a pair, a four, an eight. Size of the boat? Uh, eight's almost 60 feet long, so that's, it holds nine people. When you have an eight, you actually have a person that helps steer it. That's what the coxswain does. That's why everybody always says, hey, do you sit back there and row? Those people hate that. <laughs> They're like, no, I actually have to steer and make sure that what's going on in the boat's happening and safe for everybody. I've been in uh, Boston, uh, watched a regatta there and uh, during the, when our daughter was in the, uh, in the uh, Boston Marathon last year and watched in, in Lake Mendota and like 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning when I'm up, getting up, getting ready to go, maybe go for a run, I see it's dark out and, and I see those rowers out there just like, oh my, I mean, that's, yeah. They're dedicated, aren't they? They are, and it, you know, it takes it takes a couple hours. We're an outdoor sport; they train year round, and uh, so you're you're dictated to like usually when the best best water, best weather, early in the morning. So a lot of those programs get out and do that. Let's talk about the equipment. Yeah, break down the equipment for us. Uh, it's not cheap. <laughs> uh, like the boats, like the eights, uh, depending on where you, there's manufacturers throughout the world. The U.S. has a couple that are very good, Canada, Germany, Australia. But an eight will probably cost you anywhere between forty and $50,000 to to set up. A single skull that a person buys, depending on if you're if you're just getting in it recreationally, maybe four or 6000 If you're getting into it to race on the highest levels, you'll probably be spending ten to $14,000. 
So if I'm if I'm a viewer watching a race, uh, I'm going to look for one key word perhaps that'll give me an indication of who the best, and that word would be synchronization. It's definitely a key component. Um, yeah, when I mean, you're watching any any kind of team sport, really in rowing, I think what we try to look for is the easier they look and the more fluid they are and synchronized, probably the faster the boat's going. So it's a power application sport, and when everybody's applying that power together, it tends to have good results. When you talk about the successful ones, you would probably talk about aerobic ability, technical, how good they are with technical training, which is coaching, the, the mental discipline where a lot of people falter because they're not disciplined mentally, balance of pain tolerance. Would you agree with that? Agree with all of it. It's a sport, and just like any other elite sport, all of those things come into play. Like. We're looking for athletes to compete and do their best on a given day and all the things that they go through to prepare for that. Just like in any sport, sometimes too, physical talent can be, there are some people in our sport that are just off the chart physically talented, but if you can't put together the mental and the technical component to it, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And some people may not be as physically talented, but they're able to put the mental and technical components together and they have great success. Just like so. in life. Absolutely. Bob Knight said, the mental is to the discipline as four is to one. Four times more important than the physical. Kind of what you just said. Uh, I think it can be, yes. Well, uh, again, our guest today, Matt Imes from uh, U.S. Rowing, which is a nonprofit uh, agency uh, organization based in uh, uh, in Princeton, New Jersey, yeah. where well, you know you think of rowing, you think of the East Coast and so on, and you living in Indianapolis. And now, uh, by the way, I read uh, a little bit about your uh, your um, advancement now to uh, high performance standards. I mean, that's basically what you're in charge of. Talk about that. Uh, yeah, my, my title is High Performance Director, and U.S. Rowing is in the uh, parlay of the USOC and the acronyms is an NGB, the National Governing Body of Rowing in the U.S. So my job is to kind of outlay and lay the guidance and the structures for all of our national teams and the pathways that we take to be successful and then how we react with those uh, stakeholders that we engage with to, to do those performances. So. And, uh, the, of course, I, I followed rowing and all, along with all the other sports as uh, we watched all the Olympic events uh, at home. And uh, I noticed the women won the gold and the men not quite at that level, but uh, they will be, right? We're working on it. We're working on it. Yeah, our, our, our women's program has just been incredibly deep and talented the last decade. And our, we always like to try to identify and work with the best coaches that we can. And from the collegiate coaches to our current national team head coach, it's just been a fantastic, fantastic and really unprecedented run on the women's side. And I think we were talking earlier about Title IX and some of the, the growth and benefits. I think that's absolutely helped. And on our men's side, it's, it's a very competitive field. And so we, uh, we've been working at trying to solidify those things. And we've had some success on some years. But you only get a chance in our sport, really, you're gauged once every four years in a moment. So it's, it's got to be there. And it's hard. If you're looking at a a, sort of a, a group, a cult of maybe the best rowers in the world uh, on uh, the men's side, and the best team in the world. What would that? Be, where would that be? Well, Great Britain's had tremendous run in the last eight to twelve years, and New Zealand's got really good teams. And there's 14 Olympic events in rowing, so each event kind of has its own culture and its own spot. So depending on if it's like the men's quad, it might be the German team. If it's the heavy men's straight four, it might be the Great Britain. The Dutch team has some great some great events and stuff, so it, it kind of depends on what you're what you're at on the given event. Well, let's just go quickly to the uh, Olympics. You just came back from, and I've always had a dream. It's been on my bucket list, but uh, I don't know what's going to happen going to the Olympic Games, maybe in Tokyo, and. Uh, four years from now, but to watch the USA men win the gold medal. But, but let's talk about your experiences there in terms of just the elite athletes that you were exposed to, not only in rowing, but in all the sports and some of the most incredible experiences that you had while you were in Rio. Well, I mean, the Olympics is kind of the pinnacle of what we do, so it's it's obviously an amazing event, and I've been fortunate enough to go to, like, Rio was my fourth game. The first one that I had gone to was in Athens in 2004, and each game kind of brings its own challenges and its own rewards, and so Rio was fantastic. One of the things that, uh, for the first time, because rowing, we, we race 2,000 meters. It's a mile and a quarter. Typically, our venue is far away from where everything else is, but 
this one really let us be embedded in Rio along with Team USA. And so we got to really uh, interact and see like beach volleyball train where we were and we saw Kerry Welsh and USA men's basketball was training right next to us. So I had Kyrie Irving and Carmelo Anthony and all those guys walking in and lifting right next to us while we were working out. And he just got to do this, this pretty amazing experience of uh, the women's gymnasts and, and other sports. And then, and then sports that you'd never think of, like the women's, men's and women's badminton team was training there ridiculous athletes so explosive and so quick and you just kind of get a sense for like what everybody puts into for that moment and it was it was kind of a really neat experience for us that way boy i'm i'm uh, i'm je i shouldn't have asked that question because i'm jealous even hearing that what an experience so the national uh, team now everybody watched the olympic people watch the olympics as a sort of the pinnacle of uh, athletic uh, endeavors and competition but there's a lot more uh, during between the four years world championships uh, national events so on T take us through a, a couple of those quickly yeah like our our athletes we have a training center right now in princeton new jersey and they they start out right after the olympics or the world championships and they have an event this week, the head of the Charles, which kind of is the big event in the fall for them, and they may go to, they may go to some smaller races internationally. We had a couple people go to Germany there a couple weeks ago and race, but basically they train through the winter, and then uh, we have a, a international season that usually starts in April or May, where there'll be two or three events over in Europe in a World Cup Series format. So, we'll people, we'll take some people over there, and then. Uh, and there's about a two month down period and then we usually have the world championships in august september of every year and uh and, uh, and you traveled to all those and and this is one of the first times this has happened but all the Iams family happens to be in the studio watching us today and we're excited to see that but your family mom and dad living here uh attorneys successful people and now uh, you followed their lead but you have you know your two children here in the studio today and your wife and and you've always made time for that too. That's a big part of who Mad Imes is. It's the only only thing you can do, right? <laughs> not really. Not a lot of people would do, do. I wouldn't be able to do what I do though without without my family. So there's no question that they've been they've been able to let me do what I do. Do they get any, have an experience to go to some of these things though? I took my son to his first international event, first trip out of the country to Germany like three weeks ago. So that was, uh, I think he enjoyed it. Good. <laughs> first time he ever saw me actually working, I think. <laughs> so. Last two things. One, the future of USA rowing, what is it? Uh, continuing to grow and on the upswing. It's, it's, it's bright. And uh, I, I, I'm sure, I said at the beginning of this broadcast, you'll be entertained, impressed, and enlightened uh, as you follow the journey and catch up with Mad Imes, because I don't think many people know what your accomplishments are. It's absolutely impressive, Mad Imes. <laughs> Well, I don't know about impressive, but I've been. Uh, it is. I just said it is. I've been lucky. I've been lucky. Uh, you know, I think. I think with a lot of people in a lot of sports, hey, if there's something you want to do and you work hard and you, you know, hard work creates opportunities and you try to do the most. Congratulations to you. Thanks for being on the show today, man. Thank you very much. It's good seeing you again. Too. All right. Okay, we'll be back with some film clips from some football games right after this. LASIK surgery at Mayo Clinic Health System. You can, I can see, I don't have to wear my glasses for driving, uh, to go to the movies, for reading. And uh, I think it's a wonderful thing to offer people uh, that freedom and uh, independence of lenses, whether they're contact lenses or glasses, to be able to function every day from the morning to the evening and not just, and not think about it. For more information on LASIK surgery, contact Mayo Clinic Health System. At Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning, we have assembled the championship team. Who listens to what your needs are. We install carrier comfort systems that improve the comfort, efficiency, and the air quality of your home and workplace. We serve you with highly trained technicians who are prompt, friendly, and honest. For Gold Star Treatment, turn to the experts, Carrier and Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning. Schneider Heating and Air Conditioning, your comfort is our business. Welcome back to Seven Rivers Sports. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Matt Imes, a native of lacrosse, current coach with USA Rowing. Well, it's playoff football time throughout the state of Wisconsin. And again this year, our KQEG cameras are on the road to bring you some of the key matchups throughout the Cooley region. Let's start at Onalaska as the Hilltoppers play host to Sparta from the Mississippi Valley Conference. 
Sparta came into the game with a solid game plan and high hopes of derailing the MVC champ, the Hilltoppers. But on Alaska, had other ideas. Six foot four inch senior Braden Dewan continued to set records following the script of throwing the ball all over the field. That started early as he found Jalen Sample for a 34 yard TD pass and then Noah Fredrickson for two TD catches. And just like that, Anna up 21 0 after one. Tyler Hughes and Sample again hauled in doing passes in the second quarter along with a Jalen Zubich fumble recovery for a score. Greg Jacobs put Sparta on the board just before half, 42-7 at intermission. No scoring in the second half and a running clock. All-conference performer quarterback Brayton Dewan passed for 361 yards and four touchdowns. Hughes caught eight passes for 122 yards. The Hilltopper defense again rose to the occasion, holding Sparta to 161 total yards and only one TD. Sparta finished with a respectable 6-4 and four record, their first winning season since 2001. Good things ahead for the Spartans. On Alaska, head coach Tom Yashinsky advanced to the second round of the playoffs and will host New Richmond on Friday night. D4 football, number three seed West Salem hosting the number six seeded Nakusa from the Scenic Bluffs Conference. Plenty of concern with season ending injury to quarterback Ryan Byrne, but backup quarterback Jacob Whitbeck put that concern to rest, leading his team to a 28 point halftime lead. West Salem scored TDs in four ways in the first half, a fumble recovery, an interception return, a rush and a pass. Graham Walter, Matt Bigley, and Jacob Whitbeck led the way in the first half. Sophomore Brendan Holt rushed for 82 yards, filling in for the injured Gabe Lehman. And then senior Austin Kennedy capped the scoring with a 99-yard intermission. Interception return in the fourth quarter. Nakusa ends the season and West Salem advances and takes its 8-2 record to GET on Friday night. Well, I hope you enjoyed this week's show. I'm your host, Terry Erickson, hoping that you will have an exciting, healthy, and an active weekend.